I'll share, I'll share some good stuff. That actually would that actually would be a good that actually would be good. Actually, today we have a, a little I think some one one complication, I think, but yeah. yeah. Um yeah, sometimes those are better to learn from even, right? You know. I agree. As, as long as the video is playing, right? I agree. I agree. And management, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. All right, it's gonna be good, man. We're gonna start in a couple of minutes. We're just gonna let people join. Hopefully, our uh, the 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 young surgeons who submitted um, videos will be will be here, so we can uh, we can ask them or they can present as well. And that's great. We got Michael, man. What's up? What's happening in Denmark? Hey, Brian's on. Hey, Brian. Brian's got uh, I think the first video on the. Oh, perfect. Okay, there. good. We'll bring Brian on. Perfect. What's happening in Denmark, man? Are you uh? Do you, you miss uh? You miss residency, Michael? <laughs> uh, I miss being young, but uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I miss residency. No, but uh, yeah, Denmark is um, it's good. It's good. We have some right now. We have some really good residents, actually. I'm very happy yeah. with them. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Trying, trying to persuade them to go into glaucoma. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, you know, I think it's it's. Uh, I see more people get into glaucoma slowly. You know, we're, we're biased. I couldn't convince Amandeep. <laughs> hey, man, you're making glaucoma cool. <laughs> hey, three, three out of our seven senior residents are going into glaucoma this year. Wow. It's awesome. It's, That's it's, pretty it's amazing. the best, uh, high, highest yield we've had in a couple, in a few years. Wow. So, Mandrol, I think yeah. that's all you doing that. That's right, baby. We've got Brian, <laughs> hey, Brian, man. How are you doing? Yeah, man. How's everybody doing? I just dropped my parents off at the airport in Sioux Falls. They've spent the past couple of weeks with us because we had a baby six weeks ago. Oh my gosh. Congratulations. Congrats. Congrats. Thanks a lot. It's a lot of things happening in your life, buddy. Yeah. That's right. Well, we're gonna we're gonna we were gonna bring your video up first. Um, maybe we should uh, do it after just because I don't want you to be driving. I wouldn't I wouldn't want to encourage that. Although I'm pretty <laughs> <I> impressed. <was> <laughs> I was gonna say let's let's give them a little break here. Exactly, we will. We'll we'll, we'll skip your video and do it <laughs> later on when you're when you're maybe stationary. How's that? Sounds good. I'm ten minutes away from home, so that's oh, no perfect. No problem. Thanks for joining us. And Amadeep, Thank you. Amadeep, what yeah. about you, man? You you've uh, you, you've only been in practice in a couple for a couple of years, but I, I I know you've already seen a lot of things. Just wait till you get a, a few more years under your belt. You'll be like, I've never seen that before. <laughs> yeah, that happens. That, that day, happens all the time. Every day there's something new. It's, it's interesting. Actually, our new residents just started in the OR September 1st. So uh, Ike's not quite out of the woods just yet. Well, yeah, I mean, it's uh, we were talking earlier that, that that the, you know, July, August turnover time is always a little bit of, uh, you know, unsettling time. But, you know, people get through it. We all get through it. Everyone gets through it nicely. So I'm just actually uh, I just see a lot of our a lot of our. Our video presenters are here, so I just brought them on as uh, as panelists, um, which is great. So when your when your video right. comes on, we'll get you to make some comments. Um, let me uh, let me just get started. It's eight o'clock on a Saturday. That means it's Prism Eye Rounds time. We've been continuing to do this. It's hard to believe it's been it's been six months, man. It's been six months. I I, uh, I just can't uh, I just can't fathom that we've been in this situation for that long. And I don't know about all the rest of you, but I. At first, I was kind of—I don't want to say excited, but I was like, "Oh, this is a this is a challenge, you know. We're gonna change things. We're gonna do things." Uh, I know, I know that it still was concerning, but I have to tell you now, man, it feels tiring. <laughs> it's, like, it's like let's just get this done, man. This is so yeah. like old news now, you know. So I don't know. I'm hoping we—I uh, mean, we're kind of back back to normal. I think many of you guys are sort of a new norm, back to work. I think, I, but it's still, it's like just. Life isn't right. I don't know. What do you think, when Jewel? How's how are things in uh, Michigan? You know, it's 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 like a weird time where, on on one hand, I think we're we're kind of getting used to this, and and that that's that's tiring. That's a grind, right? To have this be the business as usual. But behind the scenes, there's there's sort of that looming threat that things are going to get worse. Are things getting better? You know, it's this it's this very unsettling kind of slow burn of stress i think that that kind of covers everything so you know clinically we're very busy still um you know which is which is double-edged right because you always have to kind of weigh the risks and benefits of having people come into the office you know the 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 limitations of virtual care this and that but um and then the sort of ever ever looming threat of things potentially destabilizing so 
Yeah, it's a weird, stressful time. Isn't it? I know. Man, Julie, you guys are going to have a vaccine before November. Oh, that's right, man. <laughs> you guys will be fine. Don't worry about it, man. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, right. I was, I was actually in line right behind uh, Putin's daughter and, 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 and filing it out. So I'm, I'm good. I'm good. But uh... <laughs> too funny. Too funny. So um, I want to. I want to get, get started. I want to. As, as you see, we have our panelists here. We have Amadeep Rai, who's uh, at University of Toronto. He's uh, very familiar with teaching. He's the associate program director. Uh, he was just he was just a resident a few years ago, mind you, and now he's of course training and he's uh, always has a keen eye on on teaching. So it's great to have you here, Amandeep, and thank you for being part of this. We have Michael Esso from Denmark. Thank you for adding an international flavor to this. Um, who's got a keen interest in glaucoma and anterior segment and complex diseases and likes to break down things into 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 discernible components of surgery on a physics level, which I always enjoyed chatting with you, uh, Michael and. Congratulations you, congratulations you on your on your eye rounds that I participated in just recently. Um, so thank you for being here. For and then we you. have Anjul Shah uh, from the University of Michigan, who um, is uh, quite involved in teaching uh, with the Glaucoma Fellowship and running that in Michigan, as well as uh, does some resident teaching as well. So it's really great to um, to uh, to be all of us here together. Um, I am going to uh, get things started, and I see we already have some panelists here already. Um, that will be presenting. So what we did was uh, a few weeks ago, as you know, we uh, basically sent out a request, a call for for videos, particularly for uh, for young uh, surgeons, um, and we wanted to uh, get submissions from you all um, with regards to uh, you know some videos that you think would be useful to to get critique from. So I'm I'm going to ask Amandeep and Michael and Manjul to maybe uh, you know. Add some constructive feedback. I will tell you that you know the videos were were great. That we had you know over twenty submissions. We couldn't we couldn't get them all here, but maybe we'll do this again. I don't want to thank my fellow Matthew Brink for helping to triage those videos to kind of put them in some order. Um, and this is really meant to be sort of giving giving some feedback and having this all to learn together as we go through this. Um, I'm going to uh, maybe get um, our, our first uh, first presenter here. Let me see if. Uh, Actually, I think we have, let me see if we have actually a presenter here. I think Brian is currently driving. So we're going to, we're going to let him get home. Um, but I'm going to maybe get, I think we have uh, Ricky online. Ricky, I think you're here, right? I saw you're here, right? I'm here. Yeah, we can great. start with that. Sure. How are you doing, Ricky? Hey, how are you doing? I, I'm doing great. Good, good. Tell me how you're doing. Where are you these days? Uh, I'm, I'm still in Arkansas. I, I, it's uh, been a little bit of a wild ride here, um, but it, it sounds like now I have uh, options for multiple places to go to get some good training the, the rest of the year and the upcoming couple of years. And, uh, COVID has been, you know, wrench in my training uh, this year. We, we lost two months of cataract surgery training back in Pittsburgh, and then one of my two glaucoma fellowship mentors decided to uh, leave the practice here a month into my, my training. So um, I'm currently applying for a New Mexico medical license. Uh, I, have, I have some friends in Albuquerque, including uh, someone who does a lot of virus suturing. Um, you guys may know Greg Ogawa. So I may go spend some time with him later this year and then also uh, headed back to Indiana um, to learn from some old friends there. Luke Cantor and I have known each other for 10 to 12 years since I started med school. Great. Well, listen, we, we, we're going to have you lead off the, lead off the, um, the cases here and uh, I'll, just let, I'll let the video start to play. Um, what, what you can do maybe is just maybe give some background on this video and then we'll maybe forward to where, where there might be some questions. So I'll let you start off and just tell us a bit about this case. Yeah, sure. So this actually was my very first day in the OR doing cataract surgery. This is the first time an attending was brave enough to allow me to do any part of a rexus. This was the first day that uh, anyone let me hold a fake emulsification probe inside a human eye in the OR. So uh, my residency program director was very brave and let me do four cases this day. Um, first one almost start to finish. We, um, the first one, he decided he wanted to re remove the final quadrant. Um, and, you know, that, that was cool. The second case, I actually, uh, removing the final quadrant, lollipopped through that, that piece and ended up uh, faking the poster capsule. So that case required an answer of vitrectomy. Uh, third case went beautifully. I did the entire case from start to finish. Patient was 20-25 the next day. And then we have this case. 
which seemed to be going really well until we got almost to the end of the case. And um, this case is interesting because we actually reviewed this case for a um, resident surgical case conference back in Pittsburgh. And there was uh, a good bit of disagreement about where exactly the problem with the case was and what caused the posterior capsular rupture. So um, yeah, so I mean the capsule, so I'm just going to maybe just pause you here and maybe I'm yeah, just going to, maybe I'll bring in Amandeep and maybe you can just comment about just, I mean, listen, this is your fourth case. So this is, you're doing great, but maybe just some constructive thoughts about just, you know, maybe the machine settings perhaps here, or maybe the position here. Anybody want to give Ricky some feedback on her, on her fourth case here, just to, on the FACO part here. Cause the only thing I was going to add, I don't, I noticed a fair amount of chatter. I see, I see how the pieces are, uh, are kind of chattering on the tip. And I just wonder whether it was an, it would be an opportunity to look at our settings. Um, too often when we uh, do our FACOs, we kind of have certain settings that are maybe our rep put in there and maybe they're not optimized for your tip or for the given case. Um, this might be a situation where you see that maybe fallibility may not be as as ideal as, as you just saw there uh, yeah. and holdability even. So maybe I might I might want to consider adjusting my, my, vac my maximum vacuum here just to allow me to hold that piece um uh, on on the on the tip that's that's one comment i i just noticed with with here but it's coming along pretty well i must say one other <clears throat> one other comment here is look at the side port a lot of egress of fluid so <laughs> even it, your your settings aren't being um fault, or, or not being adhered to because of that you don't have a closed system there so just something to pay attention to to fulcrum in, in the wound as opposed to to press on the posterior lip yeah it's a it's sort of a classic uh classic early in residency thing to kind of depress the the side port incision especially as we get a little more stressed uh and that further destabilizes things so small wound fulcrum but also trying to kind of lift with your two hands as opposed to depressing with the two hands and i noticed that uh that incision probably is a bit large maybe and again it's very common and you know we're giving you we're giving you feedback you probably already know this already because you've already done so many cases but yeah. um it is. It, I did notice here that you did put your uh, you put your second instrument behind your last piece. It looks like, right? Yeah, right about there. Yeah. Yeah, I was so trying Mike, to be you, more careful uh, on this case. That was uh, that was my comment. I, I think you really did a really great case. I mean, yeah. great job. It's your fourth case, and uh, and I really like that you put that behind to to kind of protect the capsule. And I think it's good that it was a blunt instrument. A chopper, I'd be a little bit worried doing that. I see people do that with a chopper, and I, I was worried that that could still cause a problem. Uh, if you are using a chopper, I think it's maybe better to take it out and and not have something there, or put something else that has more of a blunt surface. So so far you look so far you look okay here, Ricky. Yeah, yeah. The interesting part is is uh, just a little further on. Um, so I will comment. We were using a Stellaris Elite here. Uh, it was about a week after it had arrived. Uh, my residency program director, this may have been his second day in the OR using this new machine. And so the comment about FACO settings, I don't think we had optimized the settings yet. We had a, a rep there with us who was helping us to do that as we were operating. But um, uh, the other thing is um, most of our residency FACO training is on the Centurion, which I do think is probably easier to learn on and a little bit safer. Um, so that, that may be part of things. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Mm -hmm. So I noticed that you were doing some polishing there. Um, I see some vitreous strands, but I presume those are obviously that those I, I presume are still behind the poster capsule. Yeah, I think so. And then this is where it gets interesting is, um, you know, you start to be able to see the, the IOL doesn't want to recenter. And if you look uh, closely there, there's a edge of poster capsule there that wasn't there before I put the IOL in. And my attendings tell me it's very, very rare to, to break the bag, putting in an IOL. Um, you know, the, that leading haptic looked like it was in good position going to the bag. The IOL actually wasn't quite loaded right in the, the cartridge. That trailing haptic was kind of twisted. So I did um, probably use more force than I would normally have, you know, getting the, that haptic straightened out and, and that trailing haptic straightened out and into the bag. Um, but yeah, as soon as the IOL goes in, it just kind of goes way over and um, we have this big rent in the, 
the coaster capital. So at this point, my residency program director has taken over and is um, going to cut this eye wall in half and take it out of the eye. So before you go, before you go there, I may, maybe let's get back to the question that you actually that you had as far as where did this, and I, maybe I'll maybe I'll ask um, Amadeep for his thoughts first. You know, clearly there's a rent after the lens has gone in, um, and as you said, when you were you know just finishing your polishing. I mean, it appeared that things were pretty intact, right? As you see here, I mean, yeah, you can actually see some, like I said, some vitreous and rhesus. You're polishing here, um, Amadi. What do you think? What 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 happened here? Yeah, so Ricky, great case. I uh, really enjoyed watching that. Uh, one thing I would say is, so towards the the end of Faco, the bag looked pretty good, um, and I, the polishing. I'm not sure if that was the culprit or the lens going in. Um, I can't be sure at the end of polishing, if that was the issue. Well, one piece of feedback, if you still have the original video, is to go back and look at OVD inflation of the capsular bag um, to try to understand if it was full at that point. Um, or, if, or, if you could see a, or if you could see a rent that maybe was propagated further with the IOL insertion. Um, but th th that would have been, um, I know sometimes we edit out the parts that we don't think are important, but that, that could have provided some additional clues. So. I would have liked to see that, um, but I, I, I mean, it's hard to say. I mean, the, the other thing with the lens insertion, you're right, probably a little bit more um, force than you, you, you're you used to using in the routine cases. Uh, the, the lens was inserted a bit more um, nasally <laughs> instead of sort of t tucking it in and back. Uh, the whole lens was decentered nasally and that may have contributed um, as well. I, I do think that it, the lens seemed a very, uh, the, the, the crystalline lens seemed a little dense. It was a dense cataract. There may have been some zonulopathy with this case. During the polishing, you could see that there's some folds in the capsular bag. So all of that could have played a role. Um, but just one piece of feedback would be to go back and look with the OVD uh, inflation. Yeah, I mean, just looking at the, uh, the, the sort of pressurization of the globe when you're, at, when you're injecting the IOL, it looks a little soft. And so I wonder if this is sort of a, a bit of a underfill of the bag superimposed on that. I don't think the actual insertion of the IOL looked like it was too traumatic, but then that secondary push, again, in an underfilled and maybe redundant bag, you may have caught a snag or something. That's my best guess, especially with the leading edge of the optic going nasally there. That's sort of the center point of the, of the rent, it looks like, too. So a bag underfill in a, in a really big bag, presumably with that dense lens could, could probably be the- Can I make one, I make one comment? Yeah, Michael, go ahead. So I think the, 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 the polishing of the, of the last, you know, on the posterior capsule was a little, a little uh, enth enthusiastic maybe. Uh, so that might've been maybe a little, you know, you might've made a micro rent in it at that point. And then when you actually see when the <clears throat> when the IOL is in, implanted, or like when you push in the, the the trailing haptic, you you almost you push it so far that you cannot you, you almost can't see the the yeah. the the optic of the IOL. I think that's where the, that's where it happens. But you know, but, I mean, yeah, I I, I, told, I think I agree with I agree with um with with, with what everyone said. I I, I think as Munjul put it, Amadeep said, and, and Michael, I think it's an underfill bag. Big eye, perhaps, and uh, the second push, I think, probably caught something. Uh, and you can see the way the rent is even there. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a good, it's a great teaching case. Uh, I, I sometimes push the fellows and say, "Oh, you know what? We're, we're, the viscoelastic syringe is finished now. Let's not open a new one. Let's just kind of, you know, glide it in there, and we get away with it." Um, certainly, if the situation is like that, it's probably best to, you know. Uh, be very careful in terms of how much do we push into the eye and maybe lay things in there. But, uh, but I appreciate you sharing this, Rick. And I, it looks like you, you guys ended up doing a vitrectomy here. Um, and then you put an eye wall in the sulcus, uh, right? I think what I saw there, a three piece lens. Yeah. yeah. Good. Great. Yeah. Well, well, thank you for sharing that. Um, I want to make sure that we have uh, time for, for all the other cases. So I really appreciate teaching uh, the teaching pearls there. Uh, but, but there is a question. But, there is a question here about leaving this lens in the sulcus instead of exchanging it. Um, I think that's a great question. It probably comes up a lot. I do think they did the right thing here um, to to exchange it instead of leaving a one piece in the sulcus. Um, I mean, they had access to a three piece. It's less likely to cause Ugg syndrome later. So 
Um, but, but that was a good question. Yeah, there's a question from Jason Jones uh, about optic capture. Did, did you do you know? Did you did you guys do optic capture, Ricky, for that? You know, I, I don't know that we actually did on this case. I actually think it would have been a really good case for that. The Rexus was, uh, you know, on the small side in this case, um, probably four and a half millimeters. So it probably would have been just perfect for that. Okay. Well, thank you, Ricky. I appreciate you uh, you joining us and sharing your case. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I uh, wish you all the best with what you're going to do. There's no question you're going to be a contributor in our community. I already see that already. So thank you so much. Okay. Well, Brian has, uh, has returned from the airport after after dropping off his parents and brian i'm going to let you maybe um just you know set up this case uh and talk through it a bit and then we can maybe have some points with it where our faculty can can pause and give you some feedback topical sure. anesthesia, obviously i love topical it. anesthesia thanks a lot for letting me be part of this ike and thanks matt brink for pulling me in and thanks module for being here and good to see you all so this is a case of a 19 year old male who had a firework injury. I saw him on July 4th. He had a total hyphema, couldn't see anything posterior to it. And after the hyphema cleared, he had a total white cataract, very intumescent, as well as traumatic madriasis with some posterior synechiae there. So after another two months or so, we took him to the operating room. He was hand motion light perception at that time. And we had the decision of, do we take out this cataract and of course, the answer is yes for that. But what lens do we put in? And then the final question was, do we do anything with the pupil or do we just let it be? So here we are doing the cataract. And because he's 19 years old, this is a very intumescent lens. We made a paracentesis, injected tripan blue, stained the capsule, used a soft shell technique, and then did a needle decompression of that lens. As you can see, I did a 30 gauge needle decompression because I wasn't really thinking. I probably should have done a 27 gauge to get a little more bang for my buck there. And then here I start doing the capsulorexis through the paracentesis using the uh, micro forceps here. I don't know if that was necessary, but it made me feel better knowing that I still had a pretty pressurized eye. And here after a little bit, I'm seeing that it, the rexus is cooperating. So I make my main wound and I then continue the capsular excess through that main incision. And it's cooperating for the most part, but it is still intumescent, so it does want to run. So I'm being very careful here, but fortunately the rexus goes very well in the end. Because this is a such a soft lens, we can see that ultimately, ultimately I go ahead and just use the irrigation aspiration probe to take out that whole lens. There you go, yeah. So I just aspirate the whole thing, no FACO energy whatsoever. So at this point we were deciding what kind of lens do we wanna put in the eye? And we, we have the three options here of a standard monofocal, a light adjustable lens, or a multifocal panoptics lens. And we decided to just do a standard mo monofocal because we really couldn't get a good sense of what the back of his eye looked like. And we didn't wanna feel like we had done the wrong thing for him. Here I am just polishing a little bit underneath the sub-incisional area and then inserting a CTR because this was a trauma case, even though the zonules did seem to cooperate throughout the entire case. I'm curious what your thoughts are on inserting CTRs in any trauma case or just if it seems necessary. Then we put in a standard monofocal lens and it unfolds nicely. Fortunately, Ricky, this one didn't shred the bag, although I've done that twice putting in a lens. And here is really where the money comes in. We decided to do just a pull down pupiloplasty. And th remember, this is under topical anesthesia and this is a 19 year old guy. He was a rock star as we were just yanking on his iris here. And at the end of the case, we felt like we had a nice five and a half ish millimeter pupil. We put in some myocol and um, here I am making another paracentesis to access the other parts of the iris a little better. We decided to just kind of leave it as it is. And my question for the panelists here is, would you have done the same or would you have gone in and done more? Would you have done a full cerclage, knowing that we haven't really gotten a good look at this guy's peripheral retina, knowing that we really don't know what's gonna happen afterwards. But you'll see in just a second, at the end of the case, he's got a nice round five and a half ish millimeter pupil. He's a light eyed individual with big pupils at baseline. And that's the end. Well, thank you, Brian. That that was great. Maybe we can uh, start from the top. I mean, uh, 
in terms of the approach to a white young some possibly interesting cataract i'll let the the panel jump in and comment yeah no, awesome case man first of all uh yeah i think i think your your first point was really good about switching to a, a larger bore needle for the decompressions because 30 gauge is just often not enough and 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 with these intumescent cataracts they kind of are there's kind of two families of them there's there's this kind in which there's not so much frank liquefied you know milky kind of uh cortical debris but it's in, instead just again just hydrated as opposed to liquefied and those are the scarier ones because you can't necessarily aspirate anything through even a 27 or a 25 sometimes and it still remains under tension. So, you know, I, I, I like that you give it a shot. It kind of gives you a diagnostic test as well as having some therapeutic value using a soft shell technique to keep the, the anterior capsule flat. And you made your rexus a little small. You didn't, you didn't go big. Now there's a young guy with a, a hypermature lens. So you have a couple competing factors that are potentially driving that rexus out. So you fought that and kept it in. That's, that's, you know, really excellently done Not yeah and I, and I would add just but before i get to michael and his comments about even maybe talking about multifocal iols and in, in these cases or in general in unilateral cataracts do you do them or not but i thought you know it's sometimes it's surprising a, ni a 19 year old even 15 year old mature patient um can be quite cooperative uh you know and i think that's something that's good a good discussion to have with the with the patient and their family so that's great that you handle it with that anesthesia what do you think, Michael, what are your thoughts about uh, a multifocal eye well here or in general for unilateral cataract in a young patient? Well, first of all, congratulations. I think it was a really, really nice case. Uh, can I just add one more? I think it was a nice touch when you when you switch. You started the rexus and you switch and you kept your you kept your OVD in to keep the pressure. So you know, avoiding avoiding that Argentinian flag. Uh, that was a really nice touch. Um, I think it was a uh, you know I I agree with you. I you know, probably also with this white cataract, your your IOL calculation. I mean, I don't know how you how can you measure the actual length. I'm sorry, that my, that's my daughter <laughs> wanting her mom. Uh, so how do you measure the actual length? I mean, uh, probably you use an A scan, uh, which which makes you less less sure to you know be right on the money with the with your with your IOL calculation. So going with the multifocal is a, li a lot more risky. Um, I think um, I think it was a it was a good choice. Yeah. How many? What about your any 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 uh, any any critique? We, we want to give everyone critique here. I mean, Brian Brian did a great job, but what about some critique here? Sure. So, <clears throat> Brian, that was a great job. Really nice case. One feedback I do have with the needle decompression. So, in addition to twenty seven gauge, is when I do a decompression, what I like to do is be a little bit on the opposite side of where my incision is. So you were a little bit, um, I know you went through the side port, you were a little close to the side port. And the reason I say that is you never know which way it's going to run and your maneuverability is limited if it tends to, if it becomes sub incisional. That's the part we always hate to deal with. So I, whether it's through the side port or through the main wound, I always like to make my needle decompression just, uh, just on the other side of center. So it gives me maximum maneuverability. Um, the other comment I have, I, I know you put in the CTR for, for the possible zonulopathy. I also like the CTR here for a young person with a small rexus, right? It, it may help prevent um, some capsular phimosis later. So I thought I, I, I would completely agree with that approach. Um, so, so you can sometimes enlarge the rexus uh, once the case has gone well in the lens in the bag, but certainly a CTR can help there too. And I thought the point about just using IA was very good. I've seen cases like this that are very intimescent young people, you get a decompression and actually there's not much lens material left in the bag. And then I've seen a PC rupture with the uh, with, with either the fake or the chopper because there's not much material there. Um, and finally, I would agree with the choice of monofocal here for the for the reasons Michael mentioned regarding biometry. Can I add one more thing? Yes, yes. About, uh, because you asked about you know the choice of doing a, a pupilloplasty or, or or like you did, I think it was a good choice what you did because like you said, it's a, it's a trauma eye. We know there's a much higher risk of of having a retinal detachment later. Uh, and I don't know I, I'm I constantly get punked by my uh, VR colleagues, you know, about you know that if, if if not to make their their work harder later on if they if they do get a you know, 
uh, uh, retinal detachment. So you know, and it was a nice pupil. I know. What do you, what do you think when Julie? I want to play, play the devil's advocate. You got a you got a five six millimeter pupil. This patient's going to have a large aperture. Yeah. You can tell that even though you did a pull down pupiloplasty, you can tell the sphincter loss. That pupil is not going to come down further. In fact, it may actually become even larger. So, and it did. Tell me what. Tell yeah. me what. Tell me what your thought is, Manjula, on yeah, that. Yeah. So, so I, I mean, I like the idea, and and I think doing the stretch is is therapeutic on some level, but it's also diagnostic. You get a feel for the iris tissue. You get a sense of how atrophic, how spongy or or not it is. But but I I, I was leaning towards where you're going as well. Like I would have at least put a couple stitches in. You know, I think I think you could debate whether it's worth doing a full cerclage uh, or in this case, I think it wouldn't be unreasonable to do a couple sort of interrupted or a couple partial cerclage, maybe three bite cerclages, maybe, uh, maybe two sets of three bite cerclages, 180 apart, just bring the pupil down a little bit. Um, that's very easy. If there is some concern for posterior segment pathology, you can, you can cut the suture using, you know, using a YAG or argon laser, quite frankly, or intraoperatively, it's one snip and the pupil's right back to where uh, where it's where it's desired, but it's gonna get stuck. The, basically by pulling it down, putting it on stretch, the best possible uh, pupil aperture size is five to six. And in real life, it's not gonna be that. That's with stretch and my call, physiologically, it's gonna dilate to probably a seven or an eight. Yeah, yeah we, that, always that, we, all, we always debate that. And, and I think as someone mentioned, I think Jason mentioned, you, you can always come back and do it. Obviously, yeah. no, no, no question. Um, you know, you get down to three and a half, four, we should still be able to visualize the peripheral retina um, pretty confidently in the clinic and in the OR with indirect, uh, you know, systems. Um, and um, I, th I think Manjula's point is, is a good one that maybe a cerclage, which would be fine here, maybe in this case, maybe you'd be careful because if you do have to cut a suture, then you're basically lose everything rather than put a couple of interrupteds here. Um, but it's always one of those debates we have. There's no real answer. Right. I think, um, you know, some patients have a large pupil and they have no problems, right? You know, so I guess you could always counsel the patient. You can come back later, which I think is what is completely reasonable as well. But that would be the only comment is that, you know, certainly don't expect it to be, you know, where you see it in the end of the OR, which is still pretty large though. But I, listen, that, that was great. Uh, Brian, uh, congrats, man. Uh, Thank that's, you very uh, much. That's a great case. Where, so where are you now? These days, are you are you finished or you're still in the middle of things? I am advanced Thompson Vision as the cornea anterior segment glaucoma fellow, and lo loving South Dakota people here are so nice. Awesome. Well, good for you, man. Congrats again for uh, for for that great case. Okay, we're gonna move move forward next. Let me get our next uh, video up here, and I it's nice to see we have some of the some of the uh, presenters here. So I'll try to get to their videos preferentially this is kind of a nice way to get feedback so okay i'm gonna get uh we're gonna get we're gonna get uh henry up here henry's got a real treat of a video so i'm gonna cue you up here henry maybe you can just uh give us some uh some background on this case this looks like a pretty pretty uh pretty pretty big eye here so i'll let you i'll let you can let you start here that's a big eye sorry hi are you guys can you guys hear me okay yeah all right it's a pleasure being here um, you may see that it's too big of an eye to be a human eye. That's a canine eye. Uh, particularly, this is a three-year-old small, small breed dog presented with a bilateral anterior lens luxation. So the lens is 100% loose. It's not just subluxated. It's completely luxated anteriorly. Here, I'm, I'm doing a new approach that I haven't done before. You'll see the new part soon. But for now, I placed a trot car. I'm loosening the, or removing vitreous attachments there. This is the new part that I, I, deal for, I did for the first time in this case. I use these needles to dot them, therefore holding the lens together in the anterior chamber, securing the lens for the procedure. Because sometimes when we attempt to do an anterior chamber phaco, we lose fragments, fragments go into the vitreous, and it was actually a wrap that gave me this idea. And this is me trying this idea for the first time. Uh, the ultra chopper here is not a, not a must. I, I usually start with a regular chopper, but regular uh, handpiece, but I, I was like, I, I wanted to give it a try, create a little focus at first. You see, he, you see me doing a careful 
uh, in the bag, fake uh, the, the anterior aspect of the lens first, leaving the posterior aspect for later. So the part underneath the needle, if you will, because right, the lens is out of the, the normal position for you. So you, it's, these cases are, are, are hard because if you puncture the posterior capsule and vitreous comes forward, and you you have a big problem with an especially with an anteriorly luxated lens. So um, towards the, this towards this stage of the procedure, I typically stop and continue with the vitrector. You know, the dog lens is huge. Uh, it could be 14 millimeters equator lens, 15 sometimes. So doing the, the sometimes I've seen in humans. You guys using the vitractor to do the, the, the to vitract the lens pretty much, but in dog, especially if there's any hardening, it, it takes a long time. Sometimes it doesn't work. So I, I leave it towards the end to safely remove the posterior pole of the lens, so to speak. And and, and here you, you're seeing the last stages of the, you can see the retina, the optic nerve is in place. Here I'm removing the needles and then I'm, I'm going to do just the typical, you know, checking for vitreous uh, remnants in, in the anterior chamber. There's a little bit in the, uh, in the dorsal aspect of the eye. Um, and then I'm removing it right now. After I close the incision a little bit, you have a stable chamber. And uh, these are just basic, basic steps that we do. It's a myocall, TPA. And uh, since I had the access, I did. Trimoxy in the vitreous. And, uh, that's one day pulse with some edema. Uh, one week pulse stop, a controlled UVI is already resolved edema, two weeks. And you're going to see the last picture at six weeks post stop. So I was pretty happy with this case. But uh, don't think that that's the usual, that that was the approach for the anterior chamber. Uh, fake homosification has been a challenge for me for a long time because uh, I, I was. I was very uh, fortunate. My mentors always challenged me to try to do better, to never really be st stuck with your ways. And the typical way of doing the surgery for the vast majority of us is doing an intro cap. And you know, an intro cap, it's uh, for the removal the, the canine lens. You can imagine it's a big incision, 180 degrees. Uh, canines are like pediatric patients. They have a lot of post-op complications. And with that big incision, this dog had, um, this was a very young dog, you know, three-year-old. Uh, I wanted to maximize the chance of long-term vision. And yeah, thanks for thank, showing Thank you, Andre. That, we, it's not every day we got a submission for uh, a non-human eye, which is <laughs> interesting. Um, <laughs> I wanted to see how, what our panelist experience has been on uh, on handling these cases, but I mean, I think we sometimes do see these, we see sublux lenses, and I think what you the principles that you've described, I think, are are quite are quite reasonable. Um, Anuman Jewel, did you want to have any any comments or? You know, that's that that's I I I I'm really fascinated by that double needle technique. I would have, you know, my 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 intuition in watching that happen is the the you know infusion from the anterior anterior portion is going to cause the, the the bag to just tear out around the needle but uh but i i don't know i've, I've obviously never tried this in, in a human eye if the capsules are fundamentally different and a little bit more hardy in a in a canine cataract or or maybe uh maybe this is a way to stabilize uh dislocated lenses and um especially when they're fully prolapsed in the ac i've certainly had a a few of those here and and our my standard approach has either been um just doing a regular phaco with with the with a meiotic pupil to kind of keep the keep the chambers separated or doing sort of a, a modified small incision uh extra capsular technique which again would work in a human eye with a relatively smaller lens but you'd have to do a 14 millimeter scleral tunnel to to get this out uh using a small incision technique which would be tough so yeah that's interesting is is, is the is the capsule fundamentally different is it is a thick capsule uh in, in a in a canine eye that that can withstand that yeah the, <clears throat> excuse me yeah the anterior capsule is dramatically thicker the posterior capsule however is not that much thicker uh, maybe a little bit uh the needles go right in the equator i've played in the past 
when I was using the usual way, I, I, I was, my mentor actually started training this surgery with me. They were, she was like, well, you know, we should do better in these surgeries. Let's try uh, it's a, a way to stabilize the lens when we are doing this. So it's not bouncing around. I never liked the idea of, you know, doing that without some, some way of stabilizing. So we would do one needle only, and then you lose your left hand, and you have to always be careful with all kinds of stuff towards the end so it doesn't slip out of the needle. Um, and when doing that, I've played, place, I, I've played with the idea of placing the needle more anteriorly so that it goes through the anterior aspect, the more thicker aspect of the capsule. But um, at the end, if you're not careful, it, it, it will tear. And then once that tear starts going around and you can lose fragments and it could be kind of a mess. You know, I've tried placing uh, uh, myotics in the eye earlier in the surgery. Like you said, it's a great idea to constrict the people. But in these cases, sometimes it, it's frustrating because not always the people constricts. And like I said, if you poke the capsule, uh, the lens is just in a different position than what we are normally used to, right? So you have to be, it, it's hard to not poke the capsule uh, and then you start having fragments falling down and uh, it's, it's not good. So it, it sometimes the people doesn't constrict. I, I, I have lost fragments before and uh, it, yeah, it's, it's challenging. And what one pearl I think that can be shared for human cataracts too certainly is appropriate judicious use of your various viscoelastic agents, right? You use dispersive to, to kind of protect and create a barrier, you use cohesive as you were uh, finishing up those last fragments to kind of create a little bit of space where that cataract was. I think that's a great pearl for all, uh, all young surgeons. Yeah, when I, was, when I was towards the end, when I'm always, you know, afraid of poking the capsule, because with the, in the bag and trying to tease that, you know, I do a two-handed technique, I hydrodissect and all that, but uh, I'm not sure if maybe it would have been more useful to hyd try to hydrodissect this lens because uh, one of the most diff difficult parts of the surgery is towards the end, trying to release the, the, the edges of the, of the bowl, you know? And that's when sometimes I poke the capsule and that's when you saw me placing the cohesive as a protective bed in case I poke the cap so the fragments do, they don't fall right away. And then I can start with the vitrector sooner. But uh, yeah, I know this case is a challenging for you guys too, but I, what, what I've realized in competence, it's very rare for me to see a, a, like a 360 degrees fully luxated lens, uh, a lens luxation surgery. It's not as common as a sublux that I see Ike yeah. doing all the time. And it looks like it looks like for even I mean it looks for for a canine eye that it's uh, almost a bit like microspherophagic like that we see like in a human eye when it luxates forward, um, and those are those situations where you can use capsular retractors still you know, and and even though it's an anterior chamber you can still put the retractors on the capsule, and and, and maneuver. In fact, even when the lens is in the posterior uh, chamber, um, you know we put hooks on and the lens sometimes comes up up onto the iris almost. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's amazing what we, sometimes we can get away with, but I think you showed a really cool approach. Um, I don't know, Michael, do you want to add any last comments? And then I want to make sure I move on to our next, our next presenter. That comment is just, wow. <laughs> it was an interesting case. And, and there was, a, there was, a, there was one, one guy who asked, uh, did, did the, 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 how was it, how was the vision? Like, how did the dog do afterwards? Do you expect the this dog, dog actually... This dog did great. Uh, this dog was an experiment in a way because what I didn't mention is that it presented with bi bilateral mm -hmm. anterior lens luxations. You know, we deal with this problem in dogs uh, uh, often. And he progressed until both lenses were completely loose. Both lenses were in the anterior chamber. And thankfully it wasn't uh, in like a glaucoma attack like most of them are. And I, I, did, an intro, I did a typical intro cap in one eye. And if you like, you, you know, one day I can... Uh, for the sake of time, I didn't add that, but I, I can show you another day or another time. But the other eye had the intra cap, this eye had the, this approach, and this eye healed significantly faster than the other eye. He did great, we, even though he was a fake. I have a video of him tracking objects really well and nearby, far away. You know, he probably had, he was probably uh, more far sighted. But he, for his owners, he was happy. He was visual. 
he did great. Andre, he, Andre, just just for everybody's sake, I know we talked about it before. What are the typical lens powers you put in a in a, in a canine eye in a dog? They are forty one diopters. Yeah. So they're quite they're quite quite uh, high power. So this, yeah, this, quite, this dog's wearing contact lenses then, right? Well, he could, he could. Now, sometimes if the dog has a, <laughs> if, if it's like a, a, a guide dog or, or if, it, if, it, if it has any specific function that requires his vision to be more fine tuned, then we, we, there is a possibility of doing that. Or, or, you know, I would have sutured the lens. Um, there, there are the, the possibility, we, we also suture lenses uh, in in less lux cases and, and sometimes and uh, there could have been a possibility as well. We would have to have a special one in hand. I didn't, and I was doing this experiment with the healing with the incision size. Just one quick question, uh, Andrea. I, I want to move quickly, but I, there was a question about how do you do eye well calculations? How do you measure the uh, the biometry? In dogs, we don't. In dogs, we don't because you know they don't see very very fine uh, details like we do. They have a visual streak instead of a, a you know, a fovea. And based on studies with a large number of dogs in the past, most of them are within like 0.75 to one uh, degree uh, in metropia with this, uh, uh, even less after placing a 41 diopter lens. Okay. So- uh, Andre, th thanks so much, man. It, it's incredible what you do, what you do. Oh, my pleasure. It, uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Um, I see. I see. I, I met Henri at uh, at at some of our eye meetings, and um, and really such a keen surgeon and an innovator and teacher. Uh, so congratulations, man. Okay, we're gonna go down. We're gonna go down south to, to Australia. I don't think Luke is here, but I want to play his video because I think it's a really good instructive video uh, on on pupilplasty. And uh, this this is basically a, a a young woman who had natonic pupil after uh, penetrating keratoplasty. Um, and essentially the cataract is done. The cataract was pretty straightforward, but what we're going to get into basically is just, you know, managing the pupil. And, and I'm happy to have uh, any of our panelists just comment about, you know, things that, you know, constructive feedback. I think it's great that uh, this is attempted because this pupil is pretty large, um, but, uh, but happy to, happy to hear, hear some comments. First of all, I think um, if I can make a comment here that I think a micro forcep, and this looks like it's probably a, a vitreo retinal forcep, is is really helpful and essential in managing these pupils. Um, we saw Brian's case where he used it to do a bit of a pullout, and you know I see also here that the needle choice um, is probably not ideal. I don't know what you think. Maybe I'll get you know our panel staff. This this looks like a straight STC six needle. Yeah. Uh, any comments on doing a pupil plastic with that needle versus a curved, uh, more of a CIF four needle or a CTC six needle? So, so it's certainly been described uh, to use it this way. I find this needle to be really, uh, you know, it's just so long that it's tough to kind of navigate. But I, I, I like the the bend in the needle that really kind of helps. I, I saw Ike do this when I was a fellow uh, when we were doing uh, an iridodialysis repair in a young man. Uh, yeah. So, kind of bending the needle. You remember that case? Um, uh, helps you kind of get around the lids and the, the sort of extraocular anatomy and, and make the, makes the needle work for you. But I like the CIF4 for iris work. Typically, it's, it's just a little easier to navigate. The curve, the length uh, makes it a lot easier. Yeah, and I mean, I see, that, I see that Luke bent it a little bit, but that's not, that's not enough. And it's hard to go from the incision all the way down to the iris and come back up again without traction. And that's always a, always a concern with traction. That, um, I, I see that there's been four pairs of teeth made, and I, I love the fact that more incisions are made. I, I find people often don't make enough incisions, and it's hard then to uh, to pass the needle in the right trajectory. So I think having more pairs of teeth is great. Um, again, I, I mean, Michael, I don't know what your thoughts are about you know any any feedback here. It looks like looks like basically just a couple of passes in each quadrant are being used here. Yeah. So that was one of my one of the things. No, you know it's. For everyone, it's just really, especially, especially the first time to do this, it's really difficult, uh, difficult to do. And, uh, and, you know, I remember seeing your videos and seeing you guys do it when I visited you guys and, and you know, doing with the, you know, use the, 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 the instruments inside the eye to actually grab the iris and instead of trying to poke the iris with the needle, actually put it, like pull it over the, 
over the needle with the instruments is a, is, is a big help. And then doing multiple passes once you're inside, uh, definitely. I think this video it, it illustrates why you want to do more passes, you know, once you're inside the eye, because it's, uh, if you want to have a nice round pupil in the end, but um, it's, um, yeah. But it also just, I think it's a nice video also just to illustrate that this is, this is not, an, this is not easy <laughs> in any way. Yeah, I remember my first Sir Claude uh, was was similar in that my, the number of bites was was not sufficient to create a nice round pupil, and it's you kind of had to manage it where the more bites, the rounder, the better that pupil contour. But the more bites, the more you are at risk of cheese wiring through. So you got to kind of manage based on how thin and flimsy the iris tissue is, as well as uh, trying to optimize that pupil contour. Uh, so multiple small bites gives you, you know, better kind of uh, control, but it's also harder too. So, so this is, this is the opposite where you got big bites, but it looks like the iris tissue is, is pretty hardy. So I think it could have probably taken more, uh, you know, multiple smaller bites um, in retrospect. And I think that's what we're going back to do uh, after the sort of limited cerclage that's brought things in place. Yeah. And here you see, um, the attempt at, at suturing it looks like this is is a modified seepser knot mm -hmm. as you can see being done which which is one way to do that and before we get to the knot maybe just um a couple comments i think uh, so first of all i think attempting a pupilloplasty um is is quite worthy but it but obviously is challenging i think i i see our fellows for example when they start and doing it there's some little things that have to be taken into account for including the incisions and the needle passes and how to manage the suture around the eye and everything else. Uh, sutures breaking and stuff sometimes and everything else can sometimes be a challenge. Um, so it is, it, is, it is a lot of things to consider. Um, I will say that I think often because we're used to, to doing suture passes outside the eye, the needle often does the work, right? The needle is kind of what's moving around the tissue. But in fact, when you're in the eye, it's often easier to actually hold the needle steady and use the forceps to bring the iris tissue to the needle. And just that one concept alone can sometimes make it easier because it's very hard to pass a long needle up and down through suture, sorry, through the pupil um, iris tissue. So I think that a couple extra bites may have been useful uh, to do that. As you can see, the pupil's coming down, but you see the gaps that um, that are present. Um, and I think that's one 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 tip. But but the surgeon's doing a great job to really keep it organized, as I, I like to see that. They're using um, a knot here. I, I don't know if anyone wants to make any comment on, on the choice of how to tie sutures. Um, it looks, you know, it looks like there's a couple extra passes being made here, as, as Manjul said. Um, any any thoughts about when you're doing your first suture tying? What what suture knot technique would you recommend? You know, I think that the easiest one to integrate starting off is sort of that, uh, you know, the 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 proverbial McAhmed version, that sort of Ahmed modified uh, mechanical in which. Most of the work is actually being done outside the eye. So it's very, very much like any old suture tying. And then the only difference is you're using a micro forcep to bring the knot in. So it's a very easy transition to anyone who's done any external suturing. Um, depending on the ergonomics, you can do other techniques, intraocular tying uh, or sliding knot type techniques. But sliding knots can get a little funny. You can, especially when you're sort of uh, tired from, from doing all this work. Uh, remembering which loop is which and blah, blah, blah. You can, you can, you know, go, go, go kind of crazy there. So I like the seep, sir, uh, not, or the, uh, single pass four throw modification. Uh, but starting off, I like the McAhmed, just bring both ends out, do your external tying, bring the knot one end in with a micro forcep. And it's just very straightforward. I remember, I, remember talking to you, Ike, about one of the things I always, think when I'm sitting there is I wish they would make the I think wish they would make a needle that was not round at the at the proximal end where you could actually like hold better so you don't get the this rotation you know mm -hmm. that's you know especially when you're starting out it's one of the, I think that was one of my biggest uh, you know you know when I was doing it you know when it rotates and you know you're holding it it's, it's really true. I mean, and that's something that you don't realize until you're actually in the middle of the case when you're basically trying to control that needle. Right. And that needle is like 
rotating around and torquing and then causing tension on the on the iris and that's something that is universally a challenge yeah um any 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 thoughts manjul about what you do to kind of address that you know i mean i think setting yourself up first and foremost right letting your hands be where you know stabilizing forces getting a good grab of the needle you know even even if you're outside of the eye first and if you don't like the direct often what happens is again yeah the roundness allows things to move if you're if you got a good grip on the needle it's not going to move but what happens is as you said like uh we're we're often we're focusing on the tip of the needle and our micro instrument and inevitably what happens is we sometimes loosen our grip uh on the on the needle driver a little bit or or change our our hand orientation so if you kind of perceive that happening and it almost it feels passive it feels like something is doing it to you but you are indeed letting go of the needle just let go let go of everything and regroup you know the iris is not gonna the needle is not under a lot of tension when it's engaged with the iris tissue just let go uh, and then re re-engage with the needle driver outside the eye in a very controlled manner and then get back to work that's that's my main tip that's a great point. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to ask Amadeep a question, and I, I'm going to first make a comment. So I'm, I'm I'm going to ask you about you know you're you're about to embark on a on a on a pupilplasty, and what goes through your mind uh, having you know uh, having having you know the considerations in terms of doing something relatively newer. But a question about um, a comment, just a, again about uh, what we were just discussing here. I think that you know with the needle driver, depending on what you have, I mean, grab enough of that needle with that needle driver, you know. And usually we say, you know, use the tips of your needle, but this time you got to grab a good amount of that needle with your needle driver and be prepared to hold the needle driver in an unconventional way. In fact, be prepared to hold the micro forceps in an unconventional way. And, uh, and often I like to work, work through my sub-incisional temporal incision because we don't realize as well. The other thing we don't realize, I'm sure that you agree, Michael and Manjul and Amadeep, we don't realize sometimes what the brow and the, and the speculum gets in the way of our needles. And our and our and our and our hand passes even with a chopper, for example, sometimes. So, so take into consideration all that. Um, I, I think it wouldn't have been a problem to not do a circlage here. I think Manjul mentions for last case, and just do a couple of interrupteds. You know, take a couple of bites and do them together. It may take a bit longer, but in fact, maybe more controlled. And I like to do this little what I call a parcel circlage. You're taking two bites. Well, go and just take a third bite in the middle. If you've got two points, you're going to bring together on the iris. Just take a third bite in the middle. And that creates a more round pupil. Um, and if you do one on nasal, one on temporal, then you can basically get a nice round pupil. So those are all approaches. I have to say, I think pupil plastic can be pretty intimidating, um, but can be quite rewarding, but does require a lot of the little mini, mini, mini steps in terms of you know, ergonomics and fulcrum. So that's what I would say. Amadi, what, what, what do you think? Are you, is it intimidating for folks learning this? Uh, what, how, would you, what, how would you say you would look at this if, in terms of, would you consider doing a pupil plastic? Great question. I mean, um, so I haven't. And uh, frankly, I, I would say that the video is excellent. I think the, 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 the feedback was great, but I will say uh, job well done. I, this is a very difficult procedure and uh, or can be a very difficult procedure. And I think um, there's art, there's art and science to this. So, so really, really well done. And I'm sure uh, the surgeon will incorporate the feedback. Um, I, I think one of the challenges for someone who doesn't do these cases uh, starting to do these cases is volume. Um, so it, it can be tough for, uh, for surgeons who don't do a lot of these to, to get comfortable doing this procedure. Um, but that's why it's nice to, to take a video and dissect it and share it and get, and get feedback. So uh, one case actually gives you much more experience than, than just the intraoperative uh, pearls. Absolutely, 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 Amadeep, for sure. It's, uh, I think that that's exactly the kind of approach. And I would also add that for those interested, I think I think using some artificial eyes, like stimuli or bionic, bionicle eyes, I think are, are really useful. And our, our fellows this year started doing that, uh, partly because of the pandemic, really. And I think it's something that we're going to use now uh, in, e in every case. Okay, great. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, move forward here. Um, I think we have, uh, we're going we're gonna to switch it up a bit and talk a bit about glaucoma. Uh, we have Dr. Paulino, who's here, I think. Victor, are you here? There you are. Victor, Hi. tell us a bit about who you are and where you live and, and, your, and your story for, for a minute. But while I load up your video, tell us about yourself. Okay, I'm Rem. I'm Victor from the Philippines. I'm now a glaucoma fellow uh, at the St. Luke's uh, Medical Center here in the Philippines. So 
uh, this is actually my first case in my fellow doing uh, while I'm doing my fellowship. This is a, a one-eyed BKH patient with a with a secondary angle closure glaucoma. That's and, a great uh, case to start off for your first case <laughs> of the fellow. That's, that's, that's yeah, amazing. It's a baptism of fire, according to my consultants. So <laughs> sounds like so me. Aside, aside <laughs> aside, aside from that, the patient had already a previous phacal trabeculectomy, which failed, an AMED implantation, which also failed, and a barbell implant, uh, GDD device that was initially working. The problem is uh, the cornea decompensated, so the cornea service decided to do a, a full thickness penetrating keratoplasty. But the problem is uh, the tube was positioned in the anterior chamber, so at that time, the, the cornea service decided to, to cut or shorten the, the GDD tube. And then um, the problem was the tube retracted almost to the angles. And then because the patient has a, a uveitis, uh, there was a rapidly uh, progressing uh, inflammatory membrane in the anterior chamber that subsequently occluded the tube. So... When the, uh, when the patient presented to us, there was complete tube occlusion and we cannot even see the, the, the tip of the tube. Uh, patient was in uh, high 40s with uh, three anti-glaucoma medications. So our, we, we were in a dilemma at that time between uh, doing another uh, trabeculectomy, the, but, but the problem is uh, the failure rate for those uh, for uveitic patients, especially for young individual, is very high. And then uh, the second uh, option would be placing a new device. But how, uh, however, we want to make sure first that the the GDD device that were were implanted before were no longer working. So we decided to explant the tube. And then when we tried to uh, inject a dye, there was patency in the tube. So then we decided to just put an extension tube. The problem is there's no available extension tube in the Philippines. So uh, we were thinking of a possible alternative for the tube, and we, we thought of using a gauge 26 uh, IV catheter, the angiocatheter that we use for IV fluid. So the, 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 the portion that is plastic we 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 use the distal, uh, we use that tube and uh, connected it in the existing GDD tube, and then we implanted it in the in the uh, four millimeters posterior uh, from the limbus uh, uh, in the posterior chamber, just under the iris, to to eliminate the chances of the inflammatory membrane occluding it, and then fortunately after the operation. Uh, the IOP was controlled to 10 to 12 uh, with no anti-glaucoma medication and uh, patient is stable until now, 14 months after the, the operation. That's great. That, that's really uh, a very nice, very nice video and demonstrating what you can do with, uh, we well, don't necessarily have everything available even, right? <laughs> Using a 26 gauge angiocath. Um, very, very clever and and certainly very useful and, and not requiring uh, a whole new surgery. A any thoughts from uh, from our panel here uh, on, on, on these kind of difficult cases and, and tube issues? You know, I, I, we had a similar case. Uh, literally, my our, one of our excellent fellows uh, led off on this just uh, two weeks ago, uh, funny enough. Uh, and a similar situation had occurred where we she actually had a tube exposure uh, from, from just sort of a, a lid position relative to the tube issue. Uh, but when we explored that the uh, the uh, exposed tube was so calcified that it fractured when we were uh, when we were trying to reimplant it and flush it, and so um, yeah, I, I'm not I don't typically like using the the uh, the tube ex the standard tube extenders uh, uh, that New World Medical provides when when it's so anterior like this because it's a pretty bulky piece of hardware. Um, so what we ended up using in another sort of way is. We used a piece of 22 gauge angiocath as a as a kind of a connector, um, and then we used uh, Crawford tubing that that uh, from the uh, plast uh, oculoplastic set. And uh, Crawford tubing is very similar in size uh, to just standard tubing, but it's silicone and a little softer. 
Uh, so we used a bridging piece of 22 gauge angiocath and connected the uh, the two ends, one with the native tube and one with uh, a beveled piece of uh, uh, more flexible uh, Crawford tubing, and that that resulted in a really nice. It looks like a normal tube in the eye too. But but I'm I'm going to steal this idea next time because this is a one connection as opposed to two connections. Uh, so only you know two failure points uh, potentially in my my solution, whereas one kind of patent system in yours. I like this. This is great. That's great, man. Thank you so much for sharing, Victor, uh, and editing that video. I know, I know editing videos uh, can, can take a long time. Um, and I was talking to uh, somebody uh, earlier about how long it takes to edit videos. And I mean, sometimes, I don't know, videos take longer than the case. I mean, literally, they, they do, especially when you narrate them. So it's a real, it's a real uh, life passion to do it. And it's funny to say this. I know it sounds really weird to say this, but I would say that sometimes when I feel like, I don't know, stressed or, I, you know, you know, some problem, you know, uh, administrative problem. I, I, I sit down and edit a video and I feel so at peace with my own video, editing it and just immersed in it. So in a weird way, um, I encourage, you know, everyone to uh, to do that. Um, I, I wanted to just uh, maybe go around the room. I, it's been great to, to share, these, share these videos and, and get uh, some feedback. It's been a fun time. Um, I did actually forget to actually ask, ask Henri to introduce himself because uh, he didn't tell us about where he where he came from. So maybe Andre, before before we go, let's make sure that we uh, we hear from you, and then I'll, and then I'll ask our panelists maybe just to share some thoughts and some and some ideas and some wisdom for you know the young surgeons who are number one trying to learn new techniques. That's what that's one thing I'll ask you. How do you how do you approach learning new techniques after your fellowship or after your residency? And number two, how do you um, you know project and and share your ideas? Right. You don't often get the platform to share videos. We want to use a platform like this to have people doing it. But how do you get out there and 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 not to show off, of course, but just to share what you're doing? So, first of all, Andre, tell me, tell me about uh, tell us tell them about you and, and, and your background, where you came from, where you where you where you were, uh, where you were born and raised and how you got here, man. It's quite fascinating. Well, I'm Brazilian, so I'm, I was born in Brazil, uh, 1980. I came to the U.S. about 16 years ago. I did some student rotations in the vet schools here, and I eventually got into an internship, a small animal, it's a general small animal medicine and surgery internship that we do before the residency. That was in Saskatchewan in Canada. And then I, I went on to do a, a master in, in residency, a combined program at Colorado State University. And then I've been, been working ever since, I think. Um, Great. I, I, I just think I just think one of the best parts of uh, of these things, I mean, beyond the videos is just hearing people's stories and, and, and where they've come and how they've persevered and how they've gone through, like, you know, so many different paths to get where they are now. So it's really inspiring. Um, and and Henri, and Henri, you know, when, when we go to meetings, I always try to I don't always, you know, go and look for people to see. Even my old fellows, I'm like, oh, maybe I'll avoid them. I'm kidding. Um, but but you're you're one guy who I always try to see if we can see. And somehow we find each other in a hallway, and yeah. it's like, you know, midnight. I'm I'm you know going back to my hotel room, and then you're you're in the hallway, and we end up talking for an hour or two, just you and I in the hallway, know. you know, <laughs> in some corner, which is amazing. And that's the part of these meetings, and uh, that's the part I miss the most, really. Me too. Be, being not being able to do that, so I I look forward to doing that with with everybody here. Okay, so I'm going to go around a bit. So I'm going to deep. Um, there's a reason why you're wearing that shirt. It's yes. number one is black and you're a morning. Uh, and <laughs> number two, <laughs> it's, uh, the Toronto Raptors champions. Um, they, they are the defending champions, but, you know, tell us a bit about why you're wearing that shirt and then give us some advice about, you know, uh, for young surgeons. Sure. So obviously we all know the Raptors lost that. Hey, we got a young baby on the screen. That, that's I'm fantastic. So <laughs> that's beautiful. Um, they grow up fast, man. My, my kid's 15 months and I, I can't even remember that stage at this point. But um, the Raptors, they're, they're, they're the defending champs and technically they're still champs. Uh, we haven't yet lost the title, although we are out of the playoffs. Um, for new surgeons or young surgeons, I mean, I'm, I'm just starting my fourth year in practice. So I, I, I still think I'm a, I'm a new surgeon in practice. Couple uh, tips. Uh, first of all, the Zoom era or the COVID era has been fantastic for learning. Uh, there's been so many great webinars, but in particular, I think 
Ike, I'd like to thank you and the PRISM rounds. They have been excellent. Uh, there's been so much learning and also the collaboration internationally. I, I mentioned that in the chat, but just when people were signing on, it was just amazing to see people from all over the world. And we've got Denmark and the Philippines and the US here. It really is fantastic to be able to learn from colleagues. Uh, like Victor's case, I'm not a glaucoma surgeon, but I appreciate the creativity there. Um, I, I thought that was amazing. And it helps us, uh, even if it's not what you do, it helps you understand what, where your field is going and what your colleagues are up to. So I think this has been an amazing opportunity. And then for developing surgical skills, Ike mentioned the, the, simulation, the simulation eyes. I've also used the, the wet lab so, and cadaveric eyes. If you, if, if you have access to cadaveric eyes, they can be amazing for certain tasks. Uh, not so great for FACO, but they can be really good for practicing um, stuff outside the eye. So, so suturing should never be a concern, um, as well as I do some mission work um, and practicing extra caps can, can is something that you can certainly do um, in the wet lab with cadaveric eyes prior to heading down. And then it becomes muscle memory. So I, I would encourage people to still use the wet labs uh, if, they have, if they have access to them. Again, I thank you for the, for the invite and the great work you're doing with these rounds. No, thank you, Amadeep. And I want to put also a plug. Um, Amadeep runs the University of Toronto ophthalmology rounds, which are, are basically now being held on every Friday morning at 7.30 in the morning. And so uh, check out the University of Toronto ophthalmology website um, that, uh, that, that topics are posted. It's, it's a great, great bunch of topics that are, are easily held. Uh, Michael, I, you have a busy household, man. I'm just watching the kids running back and forth. <laughs> thank I'm you. Trying to compete. Hilarious. I saw you, you ended up in GoPro, uh, no, in Zoom video. So I, I, think, I thought I wanted to. I love it. I you. love it. It's amazing. No. Uh, yeah, you know, just uh, to echo what uh, what Amadeep said, you know, it's uh, these, you know, the the the, the age of video and, and and Zoom and YouTube and I, iTube and everything, it's amazing. Uh, I think it's a it's a big step forward for anyone who are trying to learn new stuff. Uh, it's definitely been really great for me, um, and um, I think Amadeep also said earlier, you know, about. I remember when I visited you guys in, at uh, at Prism. You know, the, the 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 opportunity to have volume when you start doing more difficult stuff. It's uh, I was really envious because you know you do like if you want to do a pupils a class, you do one, and then if it's a half a year or a year later before you actually get your you know your hands on your next case, it's just back to back to you know square one so it's just you know the the opportunity to go somewhere where they actually where you can actually do more cases that are more frequent you know it's i think it's important uh yeah so but again thanks to ike and uh, thank you for having me here and thanks for for starting this because it's it's been amazing i hope you'll continue well thank you michael and and check out michael's uh rounds i mean i know they're in, i know they're in danish if you speak danish is perfect i rounds a little i uh, and uh, and again, I mean, the initiative you take to, to, to visit and to learn, it's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, and the learning never stops. Um, even if you're a few years out from residency, uh, it's so enriching to do that. I think that's great. Manjul, uh, I don't know, you, you always have a, I mean, yeah, love, love, love the year with your fel fellowship year, amazing. And so proud of where you are now at University of Michigan, you know, leading uh, so much and teaching so much. Um, and as you, as I, as I listen to you, man, I, I just love the way you break things down, man. You, you can break things down so beautifully and, 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 in a way that we can understand and in a logical and a scientific way, man. So I just love to hear your, your, uh, the way, the way you describe things. Um, any, any, anything you can add here? I mean, you, you're immersed around training and trainees. Yeah. So thank you again, Ike. And, and, and that the, 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 the ability to break things down analytically comes from, First and foremost, great fundamentals. So I, you know, I can't thank you enough for, for that year and beyond in terms of ongoing teaching, mentorship, and 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 leadership. You know, and this is just one platform among many that you've, you've kind of helped me uh, expand my skill set. So you know, again, kudos to you and all of the awesome panelists and 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 uh, young surgeons that you're able to bring together around you from all over the world. So um, fantastic. You know. I, I, I think a lot of this comes from think, you know, mindset is key, right? So you're looking at a patient, uh, don't, fo it's easy to focus on the obvious problem. Number one, oh, this patient has trauma. They have a high pressure. Uh, we need to put a tube in, call it good. 
take a step back, think about it from the patient's perspective. What are the things that are bothering the patient now? What do you think will be bothering the patient? What are things that we're going to have to deal with in a week, a month, a year, five years? And how much of that can we mitigate today? Having that broad perspective enables us to think about what kind of tools we can use today to impact this patient's life forever. I tell patients, look, we may have to do multiple surgeries on you, multiple interventions, but sure would be nice for us to have a plan, whether we can realize the whole plan today or over a staged approach is, is sort of variable, but having sort of an idea behind it. See, we got, we got young ophthalmologists ready to go from uh, South Dakota to Denmark, ready to, ready to take the next level so we can, we can retire, Ike. Um, so, so, you know, sort of thinking broadly enables us to start looking for the tools to, to make these interventions. So we have a patient with a traumatic cataract and high pressure and an atonic pupil. Well, okay, let's think now about how I can address all of these various issues either in a synergistic way or in a staged way. Um, that's sort of the approach that I've been, I've been trying to instill in my fellows. So, you know, we can tackle multiple things simultaneously, use new tools, and that encourages us to develop new skills, you know, so that's the, the impetus to do it. And then when we start doing that, we start to see that the volume is indeed out there, you know, then, then when we're, we're, we will have more pupil uh, repair cases, we will have more complex cataracts, we will have, you know, kind of complex eyes with multiple layers of pathology. And then you start to kind of build that volume. Um, and practice is key, right? So there are certain steps that you can, you know, sort of simulate just with, just with standard techniques, you know, so just being mindful of, of hand position, eye position, etc. doing good work outside the eye enables you to do good work inside the eye. So being able to integrate all of that, I think is key, but being able to break it down and think uh, sort of meta um, is something that I picked up from fellowship and I've tried to uh, live on going forward. Yeah, really well said, Majul. Thank, thank you so much. And I, I like this as a very, a very family oriented uh, program here, as you can see with all the kids running around, which is, which is so fun and so nice to see. Um, and I want to thank again, everybody here to uh, who, who've spent their morning and thank you panelists for doing that. Uh, Brian, uh, congrats, buddy. Good luck to you with everything you're doing. And we look forward to more from you as well, Ricky, uh, with your career and, and where it's going. Um, you'll be doing, you'll be doing great stuff. Uh, Henri, thank you again as well. Uh, as I said, um, you know, really a leader in, in eye surgery and, and obviously particularly in, in vet and canine surgery. So thank you so much. Uh, and Victor, man, all, all the way from, from the Philippines, you're representing quite well. So congratulations. Uh, it's a great way to start your fellowship doing those difficult cases. Uh, and so, um, so really great to, really great to, uh, to see you there. Um, so we'll sign off here. Uh, we, We'll continue our PRISM rounds. We're looking at, uh, at, at maybe moving some times around as well. So stay tuned on email and social media and uh, enjoy the rest of the weekend. Really looking forward to what looks like is probably going to end up being sometime in 2021 when we have our first meeting or meetings that we can travel to. Uh, it's looking like it's probably going to be mid uh, or sometime, you know, in, in sort of the middle of 2021, which is a long ways away as I sigh, yeah. you know, uh, in the meantime, we have we have these methods, and I, I'm still looking. I'm still looking on uh, on different ways to uh, to kind of you know enrich our learning. By the way, just before we go, I do see some some last minute questions here, and I want to make sure we get any recommendation on uh, on iris forceps, uh, MSTs, um, uh, crush iris tissue. So now there are many different MST MST forceps. So that's that's the first thing to, to keep in mind. And you're right, if you're using the the grasper, which has like a you know, a large platform with with, uh, with with serrations on it that can crush tissue. Um, I, I I find that I typically like to, uh, and I'll, which I'll, I'm sure other people say, using a very small forcep, like for example, 27 gauge, 25 gauge is almost too small to get the to get into the incision. It may actually uh, cheese wire tissue. So I like to I like to I end up basically using like a 23 gauge um, type of type of forcep. Uh, MST does have uh, the one that the one that I one of the ones I've designed, uh, which doesn't crush tissue. It's got a, just a very uh, small tip to it. Um, Asico has one as well, um, and, and those and those are some of the ones that I that I typically use. Maybe what I'll do is we'll we'll post some of the different ways that we look at it. In general, uh, even if you do crush tissue, um, as long as you're not you know creating holes in it, you're probably still going to be okay. So 
most people just, you know, whatever they can get their hands on, they'll do. But I don't know if Manjul or, or, um, or others, Michael or, or do you want to make any comments about specific type of forceps that they use? Yeah, I'd, I'd echo that. The flat, the flat tying platform is not as ideal. You want something with a little bit of a tooth. So the, the Iris micro graspers, uh, the MG uh, designated uh, thing on the uh, MST uh, lineup is, is my go-to because um, it has a little, little, almost a little tooth that you can engage the iris with. So you have a little bit more control without crush. Yeah, it's true. And I think the equipment, the, the equipment is absolutely, absolutely key. Yeah. Um, and Henri's on, on on asking if, uh, if the Bobby Orsham meeting will be held. We don't know yet. It's, it's, it's in February. And, uh, and that's kind of, uh, I think, still debatable, unfortunately. So I, I don't know yet. We haven't made it. Especially in made, Florida. It's in Florida. Yeah, Florida's a hot cool. spot. Yeah. Yeah. We'll to Canada. Yeah. <laughs> so we will be we'll be together at some point. Have faith. Have faith and hope. And uh I do wish everybody again uh safe and security and, and love to everybody and just uh be well. Be well. Good to see everybody. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Bye guys. Thank, Thank you, Mike. Guys. Thank you everybody. Thank you all. Yeah.